Good day, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia, and I am delighted to welcome you to this edition of our 2021-2022 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. This lecture series is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and through a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. This year's theme is Ethical Challenges of Artificial Intelligence in Biomedicine, where we enjoy presentations on Friday afternoons from leading thinkers about the promise opportunities and hurdles associated with AI applications in the biomedical sciences. Selected participants in our Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab program have the opportunity to leverage these presentations as vital material for our culminating in-person grant project development workshop to be held here in historic Charlottesville, Virginia in June. Today, I am delighted to welcome our speaker, Dr. Maritza Salazar-Campo from the University of California, Irvine. Maritza is a graduate of Stanford University, USC, and holds her PhD in Business Administration from NYU Stern School of Business. She is an assistant professor of organization management, uh, organization and management at the Paul Marriage School of Business. Her research focuses on knowledge integration, learning and innovation in interdisciplinary teams. She is the founding president of the International Network for the Science of Team Science, as she is the program director of team science at UC Irvine and UCLA, and a lead contributor to the Team Science Acceleration Lab at UC Irvine. In continuing our 2021-2022 Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series theme, Maritza's lecture today is entitled Team Science in Big Data Science, Bridging the Divide. In her presentation, Maritza will remind us that all the complexity of scientific problems coupled with a growing need for specialized expertise necessitates the formation of teams of experts who will collaborate across disciplinary boundaries and generate new scientific breakthroughs. The variety of knowledge available in big data focused team science provides a breadth of expertise to tackle these challenges that would be intractable by any single discipline or any single individual alone. The presentation will demonstrate the use of formal interventions to support collaborative uh, science across data and disciplines. As always, we are streaming this lecture live and for recording via YouTube. And if you're watching on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Also, our specially selected 2021-2022 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants are strongly encouraged to submit any questions for Maritza via the chat feature in their Zoom sessions. I will synthesize these and ask those questions on your behalf during the last 10 minutes or so of the lecture. And with that, Maritza, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. We are just delighted to hear your lecture today. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, I want to give a little bit of background um, with regards to my own journey and what brings us together here today. Um, like, like Jack mentioned, I am a scholar of organizations and teams. And in understanding what makes a team of experts into an expert team, I've explored a lot of different worlds than a corporate boardroom. Um, I have been, I have worked with the Army Research Office, I have worked in Fortune 500s with teams, but I've spent a good deal of the last 10 years working with teams in the biomedical, biomedical clinical space, as well as with machine learning, deep science, deep um, people who use um, computer science and machine learning. And so what I bring to you today is a mixture of what I might present to a group of business scholars interested in gain, gaining effectiveness and efficiencies while also being sensitive to the nuances of the ventures of discovery. And um, Jack mentioned a couple of different um, spaces where I you know, show my work and contribute to the intellectual community. And one of them is the International Network for the Science of Team Science, which convenes uh, scholars and practitioners who are interested in understanding how to support scientific teams. Um, the second is around uh, UCI and UCLA. I provide ongoing consultation to teams who either want to really kick off um, well or who face hurdles along the way and could use some additional guidance. Um, I particularly want to highlight this Team Scholarship Acceleration Lab, which is um, sponsored by our Vice Chancellor for Research. And, you know, 
unless I'm ill-informed, is probably the, the leading site right now on the web for guidance about teamwork at various stages of formation, at various stages of development. And I highly recommend checking out the resources on that page uh, when you have a chance. So um, throughout the talk, I'll be talking about um, various aspects of teamwork, leadership, and especially bridging uh, the tools of machine learning and computer science and various phenomena. I want you to really be reflecting on your own experiences participating in teams using big data um, and analytics. And as Jack mentioned, please feel free to put your questions up on the chat. If you have questions, I'm sure someone else either here um, this morning on the talk or on YouTube is struggling with some of the same, uh, same of the same challenges or have the same questions that, that you might. Okay, so I'm going to start with a definition of what team science is. Um, and I say this because across the National Institutes of Health, um, the National Science Foundation and various uh, foundations, there's an increasing emphasis on team science, multiple PI investigative mechanisms or developing a management plan, which means that we're getting we're, re, we're getting to the place where we say, gosh, the technical knowledge has got to be amplified and catalyzed by the ways we interact together to answer important questions. And team science, um, it's, the, it's the work that we do collaboratively to analyze a particular research question about a particular phenomenon. And it is the case that team science can occur within a single discipline, but more often than not, we're talking about teaming or collaboration across um, across various disciplinary or methodological divides. And so this notion, and I have this picture here of Albert Einstein of the lone investigator tinkering away by him or herself um, in the pursuit of knowledge is in some ways quite obsolete. And I'll actually present to you some data in support of this view. Um, but I, what I will say that um, you know, I often say with, with scientific discovery that it's so much about the ways that we in teams even begin with formulating our problems. And, you know, he often would say, um, you know, the question shouldn't be, you know, what is five plus five, but rather how many different ways could we get to 10? And when we're in teams with people who have very different perspectives, we're more likely to find divergence and alternative pathways that just might be our means to the next big, big um, discovery. So here, here you see some data from um, scholars who were at the time out of Northwestern, where you know they said, gosh, it seems like more and more work is happening collaborati collaboratively. Is this in actuality the case? And so this work here spans 1975 to 2005. And so we can even anticipate that these these trends are even greater now. But essentially what it what this data says is that virtually in all fields, research is being done in teams. And you know, the exception might be the humanities and the arts, where painting a portrait, writing a novel is still a solo, a solo act. But what we do see is that often when people are working together in teams, they're producing work that is high impact um, and contributing in an important way more than we see an author working in, you know, by themselves in a single domain. And with um, the work that I've been able to do, um, I've had, it's been such a joy, honestly, a joy to get to work with scientists who are not necessarily tethered to, you know, what their contributions might be in their own field and ride, rising to notoriety from narrow countries contributions, but are truly curious souls interested in figuring out how we get closer to solving cancer or reducing obesity in particular communities. Um, or here in California, thinking about how can we better understand the patterns of forest fires using, again, uh, machine learning. And so in this pursuit, they have said, gosh, you know, to get to my answer in my discipline alone. I don't see the right frameworks or I think there are other other methodologies we could use and it leads them to cross the silos that are often are pretty um, difficult to transcend in our university systems 
all in the hope that they're going to be able to answer some of these really complex health or societal problems. And in drawing together the variety of perspectives, different tools, um, we have seen um, you know, knowledge synthesis and the creation of, of new solutions. So all that to say that there's, there's great promise, right? And we've even seen at the, um, you know, throughout the last two years with the COVID pandemic, where drawing together um, different kinds of scholars has really led to rapid discovery of answers or solutions. Um, that being said, um, it is not the case that teaming across disciplines, specialties, professions, or um, geographic locations is a walk in the park. And um, this data, which um, is also um, you know, about a decade old, took a subsample of 500 NS, NSF funded projects. And they said, all of these projects had great intentions around teaming and collaboration, and they were gonna involve multiple universities and various PIs. And if you look at this chart, it essentially says, well, gosh, the more disciplines, the more universities, the harder it actually is to produce knowledge output. And those scholars define knowledge output, output as patents, publications, or other kinds of products. And um, so I, on the one hand, want to say, you know, wow, teaming, it's, it's the way everything is going, collaborating across disciplines. It might be the means to some of our, you know, again, to solve some of our, our most intractable problems. Yet at the same time, when we cross those different chasms, we're gonna encounter various challenges. And those challenges come from the inherent features of team science itself. And uh, this figure is drawn from the National Academies of Science report on two, two, uh, 2015 which um, to my knowledge is the most downloaded um, National Academies of Science report to date as people are often trying to figure out how to you know, team better. But we have, whenever we work together in, in scientific teams, we're often looking at fairly large teams. Um, sometimes we're looking at teams of teams when we look at research centers that have fair, you know, multiple teams embedded within a, a broader unit. We can have um, really different goals when we come together in a team. And you know, just to highlight some of my later takeaways from this talk, we, you know, I've seen in some of my work where the uh, computer scientists on a team compared to the scholars that they're collaborating in, with other fields have really different time scales as to when work is ready to get published and what contributes a significant um, you know, addition to the field relative to other disciplines. Um, we also have team members coming in and out of teams, right? Permeable team and group boundaries. We are linked together by phenomena, by data, by our office space, right? We've, we really need to um, lock sync our interactions within teams. It's not just like, hey, I did all this work and let me pass it back over to you and hands off. Uh, we have geographic dispersion and you know, I sometimes show this, this slide where we talk about the difference between the Wright brothers making their simple flying contraption and the number, I think it's 30 plus experts that are, made, that are necessary just to do the engine in a 737 at Boeing. But in getting more and more schooling these days, we become specialists in pretty narrow areas. And that narrow specialization makes it even harder for us to connect to one another and our expertise. Um, add on to that that we see um, more, more gender parity in science. We see people from different backgrounds, from different cultures, um, people who you know, really just have this high diversity of membership. And it's no wonder, right, that we have a hard time working in teams effectively. So um, some of these challenges, again, right, as we go into the practical day-to-day -day can be that we you know, perhaps we find a couple of collaborators on our own campuses where we share a common interest in a particular problem or um, societal challenge or empirical uh, area. And we want to get to work and we sit down and we're trying to coordinate what you know and what they know and how those pieces fit together. In doing so, we're using really different 
different terminology. We're using, we're, we're seeing the phenomena from different levels of analysis, and we were trained to do work that may or may not feel highly compatible. On top of that, we get to administrative complexities. And that can come in a lot of different forms um, where it's, well, who's the lead on this project? Uh, what percent effort are you? Um, if I want to do a sub award to another campus, uh, there are just all these different pieces that can create challenges and conflicts as we try to figure out the legality, if you will, or the, the administrative aspects of working together. And then you sit there and you're going, okay, I thought this would be really exciting to go work on this grand challenge with these new colleagues. And this is taking time. This is really requiring a lot of effort when, if I were to stay in my discipline, stay with people who use the same tools, publish in the same outlets, I could probably get this work, I get some work done a lot more quickly, right? Where, where that, for many of you on the call, you'll start to say, gosh, I've got to get this many publications before X year to get tenured. And you say, forget it. I'm not doing this team, teaming collaborative work until later. So it's no surprise, right, that often when we do see collaboration in interdisciplinary teams, it's, uh, you know, scholars that are a little later on in their career. So you might say to me, okay, Maritza, I understand all these challenges, but come on, I've, you know, I've been on teams forever and um, we all know we're, we're all part of different teams. We're all doing it. So is it really as tough as you say it is? And I thought I would put this, highlight this research um, because they're specifically looking at people that, teams that are um, hoping to do work around IT, information technology, and integrate computer science with other disciplines. And what um, this particular paper highlights is that 50% of this sample, right, 55 PIs from 23 institutions, basically write up this beautiful poetic funding proposal that says we are going to work together and we're going to collaborate in this way. And the bio sketches all seem like they're, you know, like pieces of a puzzle. And then they get the funding and they start working and essentially everybody goes to their four corners of the campus and does their work until the progress report is due um, nine, 10 months later. And the PI who's a wonderful writer weaves together a nice little report, but possibly, but really um, these are like separate independent pieces of work, co-acting, but not really working together. And I'll explain what that looks like later. The second set is a little more coordinated. And they say, hey, um, we, we received the funding and we are making sure that we're attending different talks. I'm sharing my work with this other area. They're sharing their findings with the, another PI. And they're at least, maybe even, maybe they share, if this was a bio, you know, working with some other samples, at least maybe they're sharing a refrigerator or a common data set. There's something linking them together that requires a little more coordinated action around either, again, a data set, talks, etc. But this, this highest level of integration where we have scholars coming together, jointly formulating a problem, deciding how they're going to work, who's going to work when, maybe even changing their methodologies because of feedback and um, information they're gaining from another colleague. This ends up only being, you know, roughly a third of the sample that engages in this integrative cross-disciplinary work, despite everyone saying, oh, this is what we're going to do. And so, um, you know, I, I have this question, you know, is it really that elusive to work in this integrated way? And the two studies I just highlighted say, yes, it's the outcomes end up, you know, our outcomes suggest that we struggle to work across specialty and discipline. And then in practice, we often feel more comfortable just returning back to our home base, doing our work separately, and perhaps piecing it together loosely. But I'm going to guess that every single person on this call and on the internet, when you thought about investing this much time and effort in an academic career, you hoped to understand, you know, what, what is black matter or how can we solve 
this rare disease or right you hope to 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 pursue this this endeavor to make a difference and for the number of reasons i've just mentioned it's actually quite hard to socially and socially interact with our colleagues in a way that gets us closer to progress and um what i want to highlight right is that while you know getting funded getting a lab is often the product of having a series of papers and showing technical astuteness that's a really different skill than learning to lead and manage a science team and often when i have um, different investigators on you know from around the country really say hey can you help me out it's you know sometimes it's a junior faculty but sometimes it's pretty senior individuals um you know vice vice chairs and chancellors saying hey this is this is more than i thought i now have a lab of 10 plus i'm leading a budget of over a million maybe you know two and i have uh administrative staff that i'm keeping on full time and I am now a manager. I'm now creating workspaces, work processes. I'm getting updates and I didn't go to school for this. I went to school to learn how to, I learned mathematics, I learned coding, not this, right? And so some of what, you know, what what is my, you know, why at work and why I do what I do is to try to say, how can I supplement what is, you know, the gift of, um, intellectual prowess with the leadership and management skills to really make sure that science teams and individual collaborators tap into their fullest potential and don't and end up in that 35% that is able to truly integrate and create new knowledge um, by piecing together dis disparate expertise and tools in some novel way. And so you know, what do I mean when I say effective team scientists? Um, generally, I believe that this is about learning to take a project from formation all the way to completion. And when we have various experts in the room, creating space for all of those different individuals to um, share how they see the problem, what they see in data, um, how to create values like ethics and transparency that enable people to work in a synchronous way um, is really key. Not to mention that it doesn't take very much for a, a team to become factioned and to have us then dynamics. And in particular, it's very easy for computer scientists and data scientists to seem like, you know, the uh, means to an end, right? The, oh, well, we are the scientists doing the work and they're just running analysis in this way on the side. And really, as many of you on the call know, that's not the case. And in fact, new insights can come from the data that can reinform perhaps the, you know, the primary discipline or the, the content experts. So we want to think about how do we not uh, allow for there to be any discrepancies in power and status and who deserves a quote unquote seat at the table or the time in a, in a work meeting to share what they see and to share what they know. Um, I have this comment here about the ease of deferring to high status individuals and groups, which can mean, you know, senior, um, senior individuals, maybe men over women, perhaps people with more technical ability rather than qualitative skills. There's so many different ways that we let uh, status and hierarchy, um, you know, rear their ugly heads in our scientific teams. And ultimately we end up hearing one dominant voice. And again, the science becomes less multiplex and multifaceted. And so ultimately, when I walk in and I, uh, to a, a team, a team being led by an individual, I'm looking to say, is this a person that is leading in a way where they're getting participation, there's richness, there's a sort of feeling of team flow around uh, the work itself? Um, and do people want to stay working for this particular individual, especially since it's a choice? So uh, 
you know, I, I had asked Jack ahead of time on campus at, at or, or elsewhere, I really think that there's value in seeking out training and development as it relates to who you are as a leader and how you could lead more effectively. And I'll highlight one example of the sorts of trainings that I provide. Um, and the reason that these workshops are useful is that you can gain skills in how you're communicating, how you're leading, how you're managing team processes. And even for some of you who are underneath lead PIs, thinking about, well, how do I you know, manage from the middle or even from the bottom in terms of making clear what your role is on a team, how you're, how you're seeing the work, um, aligning with your PI's, um, you know, six month year plan and making sure that you're getting what you need from all the teams that you're a part of. And in scientific teams using big data, I also think figuring out how can we use different tools to make sure that others can gain access into what we know, whether it's the way we're writing or visualizing either data or the ways we're going to work together. These can be very, very important to unlocking the potential of teams. Um, and these are just some different examples of the kinds of um, either one on one in a way coaching that uh, I've been able to do with teams and the research that I've done on various interventions. So um, I want to I want to say that you might be going okay. Um, I see that you do a lot in various areas, but what do you really know about data scientists and our work? I just wrapped up um, a five-year uh, national research training grant at UCI, where we worked with, in the end, about sixty doctoral students who were either connect either from the computer science department doing machine learning. And they were partnered with individuals from either earth system science, chemistry, physics, and a little bit in biology. And what it meant was that every trainee that came into our group was essentially assigned a mentor who was a computer scientist and a mentor in the other field. And it meant that there was this new frame around what does it mean to create the transdisciplinary scholar who's working at the interface between this novel computer science, computer um, decoding uh, tools, and then the particular field context. So we move, we, you know, we, we're, we're currently writing up some papers where we're suggesting that we've got to move away from this notion of the scholar having a single mentor to them having a constellation of support systems that enable them to perform effectively. Um, one of the things that was really useful in training and developing these scholars was to create, to, to group them together in micro uh, communities within their various cohorts where they were assigned at least one computer scientist PhD and then individuals from the other disciplines with the hope that they would learn some new statistical or modeling approach. And then we asked them to present what they learned um, to the broader community. So examples of this became, we heard, um, we obviously heard about different uh, machine learning techniques. We also learned about novelty in machine learning and um, audio and visual um, expertise. Very, lots of new approaches were brought about in this group. But what really mattered, I'll, I would say, is that the scholars were placed, they were, giving, they were given data and exposure to new modeling techniques. And in these communities of learning, we were able to see more transfer of expertise from student to student than we would have even if faculty were giving presentations from the various departments. But as we prepared these scholars to work with these two mentors, we made sure that they were received training and communicating across disciplines, thinking about how their teams are composed, managing conflict, uh, managing their mentor and mentee, and also um, some basics in where, you know, tips on knowledge generation or create, you know, generating creativity in their various work teams. And what, I, what I'm quite proud of is what we saw, um, we had an external evaluator over time and we were able to see a pretty, we already, you know, I'll say first of all, this is self-selection. Uh, any student that chooses to do this interdisciplinary work, work already probably has some sense of efficacy in doing so. That being said, we were able to increase their um, 
their confidence in being able to, to you know, have engaged with others in a positive way, in an interdisciplinary way by about 7%. And then um, we really focused a lot on communication and how they could better interface with their various mentors and with students in different, different domains. I wanna highlight though, um, I'm gonna go back here. I wanna highlight a couple of takeaways though from watching these um, various teams. And so in the end, we ended up with, I ended up studying 60 different triads of computer scientists and individuals from the uh, physical or, or chemical sciences. You know, the very first is that um, the, the students themselves and the, the computer scientist counterparts really did have to roll up their sleeves and become content experts. And again, the, the domains included everything, like I mentioned, from forest fires to um, patterns of forest fire. They basically got uh, pixel data from NASA to understand changes in forest fires. We looked, there was a lot coming off from linear accelerators, data of boson Hicks and other sorts of complex data sets. And the students could not just from an armchair say, oh, well, you know, show me the, show me the pictures of your data or show me, send me the output and I'll run some, some, some algorithms on them. Just wasn't the case. And I think we're all seeing now, it's no longer, you know, 2010 where we can generally get a phenomenon and try to apply a machine learning approaches. I think it is the case now that one has to become really steeped in the context or in the phenomena that they're interested in because the cost can be a risk of underestimation. And quite often, as students would spend a lot of time in a chemistry lab, looking at certain reactions and seeing the output in the computer data and then needing to code it, it would be like, oh gosh, I didn't understand that there was this assumption or that assumption that I didn't, I didn't build into my model. Um, and, um, and then communicating sufficiently what was happening with the, you know, the programming to the person who was in the other discipline, I, I just can't estimate, I just can't, um, you know, overemphasize enough the value that comes in learning how to simply convey how a model was built, what approaches, what, what um, estimations were underlying a model, et cetera, et cetera, in a way that individuals from the other discipline could really capture. And then on the other hand, making sure that the individuals who were, you know, content or context experts also gave enough of an understanding of the trends and the nuances and the long-term shifts in what they were looking at to allow the computer scientists to have an adequate picture of what the work might be. Um, and and I, I wish I could say it was a meeting or two, but it, it's not, right? It's hours and hours of sitting in another person's work domain to really understand uh, what it is that they're, they're looking at. And I will say, I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball or anything, but I, I would say that the students who, you know, maybe there might be one or two content domains that a computer scientist over the course of their career to really understand quite well um, whether it's some, some biological phenomenon or uh, there's, a, there's just too much of a risk of not truly understanding what you are trying to represent with data. And again, I know Jack was very interested in ethics, but perhaps misrepresenting the phenomenon because you're just not uh, sophisticated enough in your understanding of that phenomenon. And so putting in that time and effort as early as, as in the graduate school years to get familiar with other phenomena, I think is quite, quite important to do ethically sound modeling. Uh, so I'm gonna highlight a little bit about uh, some recent work that I'm uh, hoping to submit here in the next couple weeks, where, um, you know, you say, well, you know, I'm just very interested in saying, how can we help scientific teams produce more and be more effective? And there's a bit of a bias in the research and that when we see the successes of scientific teams, collaborative science teams, um, there's bias in that they survived and they made it through the rough patches and were able to celebrate their wins. And I do know, um, you know, qualitatively, the number of times I see investigators come together across campus, have a couple of meetings, and then nothing ever really comes of those first initial 
um, points of convening. And I wonder, well, is there anything that could be done to help in those formative stages of development to enable scholars to connect and interlink their knowledge in a way where they can see, oh, this is what we could really do together in a little, um, you know, fast track it in a way. And often, um, you know, we in, in, in traditional management research, we have a task, right? We need to market this particular product. Marketing requires, you know, people that know A, B, C, and D. Let's make sure we staff the team and get to work. The thing about scientific exploration is there's often a lot of uncertainty about what we're looking at. It's changing all the time. And as a consequence, the solution and who we need to be on the team is also always changing. And I have these images of the COVID, um, uh, of COVID, right? Because it represents a biological system that it, one day we understand it one way and the next day it's transforming and we're having to update our models, update the ways we see the problem in order to, again, find an updated solution. But regardless, when we're thinking about um, putting some structure to team training when teams are coming together around problems that have no clear endpoint. To me, this is a conundrum where I say, well, gosh, it's no wonder that so many science teams never really launch effectively. So I wanted to see um, where I could, I started to sort of look around for what might be useful in understanding this problem. And I turned to some of the work on entrepreneurial startups or groups, and then a little bit to the literature and corporate strategy development. And in both of these literatures, you think about, um, you know, how do people bring brand new products to a market, a market that might not even exist yet because they're about to create it? Um, or how do companies define strategy when their environments are always shifting, when competitors are moving, um, pandemics are happening, right? How does one plan when there's so many moving parts? And a lot of what this literature suggests is that you know, suggesting that a plan is bulletproof, solid, laid out, that the steps from start to finish are very clear is just not practical. And rather what comes up in a lot of these different spaces is this notion of piecing together a provisional, a provisional plan, an initial scaffolding for, hey, maybe this is something we could do. And then offering up some, opportunities to probe or test or, or essentially, you know, hypothesize and say, well, maybe if we try this, the, you know, the customers will like this, or perhaps if we move in this strategic direction, just in one regional site, we can see the effect and maybe consider and possibly consider that for the company, um, you know, all around the company. So what um, my colleagues and I did is we basically built a um, it's about an hour and a half um, exercise that we took teams that had just received some seed funding to come together um, after a, you know, half a page uh, intent to work together and thought, well, what if we bring in an, you know, an external facilitator to help build this provisional plan um, and, and, you know, for better or for worse, we do know that um, teams don't often autocorrect and they will, you know, you guys have all been in these situations where one person talks for the, you know, the whole meeting or um, you sit there and you go, gosh, I didn't really hear what everybody around the room knows. I only heard two or three people talk and you go to a, several meetings in a row and you really just don't know where the team is going. So we thought, well, perhaps we can create some structure and help teams identify a potential uh, potential aim and maybe a couple prototype a couple of exploratory activities or studies that they could do to get them on the right track and in doing so um, perhaps do better than uh, teams who do not receive this external support to um, to develop in the early stages. And I think there's a lot of room for this, right? If we think about the number of hackathons and boot camps and um, you know, maybe even 
is startup ventures. I think there's a lot of room for thinking about what can we do to support formation of a team in these very, very, very nascent stages. And so what we propose here is that those teams that receive what we call this provisional planning or scaffolding intervention are going to be better at knowledge inter integration. We have a scale for it and we look at, you know, their ability to create some outputs. But beyond that, we say, gosh, even in creating this uh, hour and a half, not very long exercise, we're going to get, we're going to see more efficiencies where individuals in the room are going to have a better understanding of what other people in the room know. They're going to have a faster crystallization of what they're capable of as a set of prospective investigators. And third, when they think about the work they may want to do, they might actually piece together, oh, you can do this with, you, you can gain these samples or you have this imaging and I have this you know, deep learning approach that I can apply, right? And the group will start to see their potential. And in that, make it over the hump of being that, you know, again, team that meets a couple times and never takes off to actually crossing that first hurdle to saying, you know what, this deserves a spot in my week. I think this team is worth it. And the promise of what we could do together could be worthwhile. Let's see where this team goes. So we took teams from around the country who were um, given pretty small seed award from their clinical and translational science institutes or awards. And um, most of these teams were looking at some sort of biological cause of disease. And we ended up with about 26 different teams that were randomly assigned either to receive this external support or not. And they worked together for six to 12 months, hoping to submit another proposal, hoping to get some work accomplished. And you know, here's a sort of, we did a baseline, then we did the intervention, we followed up, and then we wanted to see some of the outcomes of these teams. Now here's an image from um, one team, actually this is in Virginia, this particular, not at, not at your institution, but another in Virginia. And uh, we ask in this exercise that they put the aims down, they think about who needs to be doing um, what work on the team, what it takes to um, essentially put together a beginning plan of what everyone could do over time, what resources are available on campus for them to use, again, through a series of nine, nine steps in the hour and a half. We measured, again, knowledge integration. We had a couple of different questions, things like, by combining what everyone knows in this team, did your team come up with a solution that differs, differs from the way that things are normally done? Um, or the team demonstrated its originality and its work due to the combined contributions of its various members. Also, we, we asked them for their traditional measures of scientific productivity, right? Things like um, their publications, their funding, and their subsequent grant submissions. Um, we measure those intermediate factors that, again, the psychologists like myself are very interested in. Um, here are some of the mean standard deviations, and 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 I, you know, I I'm, I understand too the low sample size relative to some of you in data science. Um, it's probably appalling, but I'm hoping you'll bear with me to see the gist here, which is that we did find that the teams who receive this intervention, they end up more productive and they end up integrating knowledge, integrating knowledge more. And sure enough, they learned more about who knew what in the team and they gained a better sense of confidence in what the team could do together. But those two factors did not lead to the outcomes. The only driver that was explained the relationship between our intervention and improved knowledge outcomes and knowledge integration was a better understanding of how everyone's expertise fits together to accomplish the aim of the group. And here's some of that output data that I was sharing with you. Um, we see higher knowledge integration in the scaffold intervention. Uh, we see they're uh, similar for how much internal money they go on to ask for from their campuses. But take a look at their external grant submissions. Almost every single team in our intervention ended up being ready to submit a grant in six to 12 months, faster than the other group, which would probably get there, but not quite yet at the point of um, collecting our last round of data. 
we see almost twice as many publications and we also see a higher impact factor from having just supported again the social interactions the knowledge sharing processes at the very beginning of team life which highlights for me a couple of important things you know one is that we you know we move beyond this notion of you know pieces of puzzles that simply need to be adjusted to recognizing that scientific work is more fluid, flexible, and adaptable. And this provisional plan, where we literally tell everybody, this is not set in stone, let's just talk and hypothesize and play. This is very functional for scientists to wrap their minds around or investigators. But we also see that maybe just like we, you know, we see in child development, where imprinting ages zero to five has a particularly strong effect, that perhaps the time, the timing of an intervention for a scientific team early on is really critical to setting standards of how we should interact and, and, and how to collaborate and, and sync our knowledge together. Uh, you know, it's definitely a plug for not assuming a room of scientists who've all get, gotten scientific training is well equipped to manage social interaction and facilitation to get to solutions and occasionally bringing somebody in from the outside to watch how people are communicating, to see how information is being shared, um, et cetera. Um, I will say that um, one key that I will highlight for this particular audience is um, as we think about coordination in data science, data sciences, I, I do think that what I, what I often call a, a communication covenant could probably be very useful and especially in combination with some basic software engineering know-how things like hey what you know a document that's like when did you last touch the code what code are you using how will we indicate versions of code um you know making sure that there's an understanding as people are coordinating and synchronizing around data so that a, you know, a supervisor, a PI can go into the data and literally see who's done what. Um, I cannot emphasize enough the, um, the ground rules for interaction, either technically or socially. It's really like the essentials of teamwork that you just, you know, if it's not happening in your lab and this, I would maybe spend a day in the summer just covering, hey, what are my expectations for um, the ways we interact with the data and enhance transparency about what needs to get done? Um, generally for effective, you know, kind of a couple of last points um, for all the proposals and works, work that you have ongoing, it's really important to always highlight, hey, who's gonna do what, who's responsible for what, uh, how do we link together in a project? You saw in my um, intervention picture that there are you could visually see the projects and who was going to be working with whom. Really useful for everybody to see um, the work. Um, identifying how people are going to interface across different components. Um, and then if you're interested, we do have measures for assessing team, team cohesion, team integrative capacity, team transdisciplinary orientation. I'm happy to share any of those with you. Um, as a leader getting ready to you know, go for your next funding, um, I want to say to you that you have to showcase, yes, I can do machine learning. Yes, I can apply my tools in these novel ways, but they're going to want to see more and more language that suggests that you have the management skills to bridge, to lead projects, to connect different sites and um, data points and institutions around big data. And I, you know, have a couple of some text in here about ways that people create this narrative about their soft skills to assure funders that they're the right person to take on the quite hairy nature of big data meets complex phenomena together. And if you feel like you could use a little support, there are individuals like myself where, you know, you can, and I, again, I would go to your CTSA and see, but you can say, can I put you on for 1%, 2% so that in my management plan, I say, yep, we have, here's our problem, here are our bio sketches, here's, um, you know, how we're going to work together. But we've also brought on this team science expert who will be doing our kickoff, who will check in once a month, who will be fine tuning 
um, the ways we interact and, and connect with one another, it's okay to, to see the limits of your expertise and bring on others who can serve as a sort of checks and balance, again, catalyzing, fast tracking, smoothing out the interpersonal challenges that come up as we team around quite um, challenging phenomenon. So um, I think with that, I just have my last um, thank you. And if you wanna connect on LinkedIn, you know, feel free, I'd love to stay in touch. Maritza, thank you so very much. You know, as you were talking, you had that early example which you talked about of the 55 PI and co-PI project and they were all gonna, it all sounded really great on paper. And then they got the grant and everyone just kind of like, it was just this diaspora of activity and all that promise for team activities and how people are going to work together sort of, I don't know, kind of didn't happen <laughs> until the progress reports do. And anyone has to kind of make it up on the oh, spot. Which Jack, you know how it goes. It's like, hey, send me your paragraph. Hey, you send me your paragraph and I'll weave it together and make it. Make Marissa, it all I don't and... know what you're talking about. <laughs> I've never been involved in any kind of project like that, but I think it's really interesting because, and Frank, on all honesty, I have, and I'm sure that many of the people listening have been involved with those where it's, you know, it's a great idea, looks great on paper, and you were able to convince reviewers and you get the money. And then all of a sudden, the team element of it sort of goes by the wayside. And trying to find ways to kind of maintain that teaminess is super important. And I think some of the ideas you shared are, are super important. One thing I wanted to, to ask about is one thing which we're doing sort of right now on Zoom is how is team science affected by our remoteness now? Usually, you know, in team science, it's like we can all get together in a conference room and we can compare notes and we could do a post-it slam and we can do all the things. In Zoom land, it's a little more difficult. What sort of recommendations do you have when we're kind of working in this way moving forward? Uh, so I, I appreciate the question because I think the way we, we collaborate is always going to be different moving forward. Um, the, the first comment I have is around this communication covenant that I mentioned um, prior. And I think why that's important is when we don't have the safety, and I mean that in uh, catching our inefficiencies of walking past each other in the hallway at work to say, how's that project or where are you on that? Uh, we end up with a lot of blind spots. And so um, where I think it's useful is to set up a couple of um, best practices, right? So one is before a Zoom meeting, making sure that there is a digital agenda, maybe a Google sheet that everyone can see, um, maybe assigning someone to be a uh, note capture of what is shared, uh, because often it's hard to facilitate and capture everything that's being said at the same time. Yeah. Um, having things like a paper progress spreadsheet where you can literally go around your lab and say, hey, where are we on this? Where are we on that? And then, um, and then I would say, and this is especially for, you know, graduate students and junior faculty, um, I would, and if you're not meeting regularly, and it was probably more the case in the height of the pandemic, but I would get in the habit of um, figuring out, does your, whoever it is that you're, you know, working with the most, do they want an update uh, on paper where maybe it's an email that says, hey, as an update this, this week, I cleaned this data, I built this model, I met with these two other doctoral, you know, graduate students. Um, but that's a sort of reporting up so that you know what it is that's going on. Um, I do think that a lot of the, um, when I would do some various consultation around campus, I did feel that there was less, like the social sciences and other areas where you, the scholars couldn't do their work because they couldn't physically interact because of the COVID pandemic. They were more negatively impacted than scholars like yourself, Jack, who the data, they could access it from wherever they, they are. Um, but I do think um, just again, having that same covenant of, hey, are you working with the file or am I? Which changes did you make? Do I understand them? Um, being, making sure that there's a space to ask questions about whatever phenomenon it is that you're looking at so that you don't make assumptions and not accurately capture 
the complex problem that you're working on. I don't know if yeah. that's helpful at all. That, that, that's fantastic. You know, I mean, it, in some of what you're touching on there, it kind of was getting to one of my next questions was a, a lot of us, when we start off in, in science, so we have those kind of heady days of being a post doctoral researcher and we're really like our nose is just like up in against the computer screen. We're doing all sorts of really cool data analytics and we become assistant professors or more senior professors for some of us. And we, we, we stop really doing that kind of intense scientific investigation and we've become kind of the, you know, the managers, the middle management CEO of the, the Van Horn enterprise, for example. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to make sure that people are supported, that they have the resources they need they, and that they're, uh, any, if there's any challenges that they're overcome and that it becomes the dominant thing in one's life. And I think you're absolutely right when you said that we didn't train to do that stuff. <laughs> no, no. And actually, Jack, when I have individuals and some of which, you know, we know fairly closely in common, they will come at that point in their career and say, I'm buried in admin. Yeah. And I think I could find ways to become more efficient at it because why I am in this career is to answer big questions. And if I look at my average work week, I'm barely getting to them. And even in that space, when we think about what leadership is in a scientific team, it's to, it's to see not with our eyes, but to have vision into the next scientific um, area of inquiry right, to be the next, the first ants at the next big space to do important work. And one cost to me when I hear senior people like yourself saying that is, where's your play at so that you can take your lab into new spaces they never could have thought possible. But because you saw it first, the lab was in a great position to be doing, whether it's visual AI or, you know, I don't, I don't really know what the next, you know, big corner might be, but, um, where that you sort of like reading and exploring just stops as a cost of, of so much administrative work. In certain areas of team science, there might be some bottlenecks. They could be bottlenecks of communication. They could be bottlenecks of just kind of the, the cold start problem or what have you. Um, do you see like data science playing a role in helping to kind of like push through some of those more expeditiously? Uh, I do in that I think, like I was just listening to a talk on uh, health, health equity, health inequities and big data. Mm -hmm. And I think if there's, there's some real opportunities in highlighting, again, kind of like that, um, where should the, where would work be most fruitful next? And I do think that there are patterns and areas that um, machine learning can really be important in that area. In terms of bottlenecks, I mean, I can't say, I can't say, I, unfortunately, I feel like sometimes it might be in assuming others on your team have coded a particular way that there's no mistakes in the way, in the language they're using and moving forward only to go, oh no, two weeks ago, there was something done that shouldn't have been done. And having again, the ethics and the, the sense of, of value to be like, we have to stop and go back. We've got yeah. to fix it and make it right when the pressure to get things done and to manipulate data because who's really gonna know how to check it or fix it. I mean, I, I saw a lot of my graduate students really struggle with the sort of phishing or um, manipulation of big data because it is sometimes so easy to do, but the bottleneck will be who's willing to say, hey, we've gotta, we've gotta do this right. Let's go back a couple of weeks, let's fix this and then move forward. Um, any reactions to that answer, Jack? Well, I was going to say that you touched on something about students and the role where students can, you know, today, as, which is completely different than how it might have been 20 years ago, is that team science is almost baked into the type of work that we do. How can we make sure that students are being further trained and educated about the best ways to be, uh, to, to leverage team science in an right. ethical way? Um, right. And how can we do that better so that when you get to a situation like the one you describe, it's just, yep, that's exactly what we do. We go back right. and we unspool the problems that we've created and we find that, that trouble point and then fix it and move forward again. How do we do right. that best? 
yeah, I, that's where that's where when I say leadership is very much about um, walking the walk, and in in recognizing that for many you were like their the first parent, right? When they work for you in the lab and they're watching and they're saying, how does my advisor, this assistant professor that's so smart, so bright, how do they handle? And they see all the various events, and that becomes their code of conduct, their way of working. And it's, I think it's a personal, a personal promise and commitment to say, I'm going to run my data science lab in a way that's upright. Here's our standards for, you know, how we manage data. When we say, I've got to raise my hand and say, stop the presses. We need to check this, check that. Like, it's in your behavior that your that the, this generation and the subsequent generations of data scientists will learn how to do work transparently, fairly, and ethically. Absolutely. And thank you, Maritza Salazar-Campo from the University of California, Irvine, for sharing your <laughs> thoughts with us today. This was a wonderful discussion. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Have thank a wonderful you, weekend. Thank you, everyone. You too. Bye, everyone. See you.